Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the 2020 Hot Topics in Environmental Law Summer Lecture Series. I'm Jenny Rushlow. I'm director of the Environmental Law Center and associate dean for environmental programs at Vermont Law School. And we're very pleased to welcome our viewers to our online presentation today. Um, as I'm sure you're all aware, due to COVID-19, um, we, like everyone else, have had to go virtual this summer, and that includes events like this lecture series. Um, so if you'd like to see the full lineup for all of our Hot Topics lectures in this series, you can go to our website, vermontlaw.edu slash hot dash topics. Each of these talks is worth one Vermont CLE credit. So um, please keep track of which talks you've attended for your records in order to get that CLE credit. We'll have time for questions and answers after today's presentation. So please type your questions in the chat box at any point during the lecture, and we will get to as many of them as we can in the remaining time. And I'll be acting as the facilitator to ask those questions of our speaker. Our speaker today is Chris Root. Um, Chris joined Velco as Chief Operating Officer in March 2014. He previously served as Senior Vice President of Network Strategy, which is a branch of National Grid. He holds a Master's in Engineering from RPI and a Bachelor's in Engineering from Northeastern. He also completed the program for management development at Harvard School of Business and has authored, co-authored, and presented papers in many different forums. This is Professor Root's fifth year in the VLS summer program where he teaches the three essentials of the electric grid class um, and his portion focuses on engineering essentials. Today, his talk is entitled Status of Renewable Energy Generation in Vermont and the Changing Power Grid. Please join me in welcoming Chris Reed. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate it, Jenny. Um, I'm going to pull up my presentation now. And hopefully we're good. Okay, thank you everyone um, for joining. Um, I'm going to make an assumption right now that everyone can see my screen. And um, so what we're gonna talk about today is the status of renewables in, in Vermont. Um, the grid is changing very, very rapidly. And I think I'll give you a little bit of insight in the power system. Um, the things that are going on in Vermont are not that much different from what's going on in California or Hawaii or uh, Arizona, in places that you would normally think that it is, makes perfect sense to have a lot of renewable energy, uh, particularly solar, to have. But I'm gonna give you a little insight of what's going on in Vermont because I tell many people, Vermont is the Hawaii of the East, right? So we have um, a very high percentage of renewable energy in the state with visions of much more uh, happening. And the, the other thing about uh, us versus Hawaii is um, our mountains don't blow up, right? So our mountains don't blow off. We have nice mountains that stay there and are stable versus um, um, potential volcanoes. So um, I am going to, uh-oh, why can't I change it? Sorry. Oh. Um, I'm having a little issue of trying to advance my slide. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
All right, so um, I'm going to start off with a little bit of history about a little about Vermont. So Vermont is um, there is one transmission company called Velco, which I'm the COO of. Um, it was formed in 1956. It was actually the first one that was formed this way. Um, it was kind of a I would call it a cooperative model in some ways. Um, it was formed because in 19 in the 1950s um, there were some power plants built on the St. Lawrence Seaway. And as part of that um, deal was that because of the funding mechanism, they had to offer some of that power to municipal power systems throughout um, adjoining states. So that included Vermont. So, but the problem is Vermont didn't have a transmission system that allowed it to get that power from upstate New York to Vermont. So what happened is that all of the states inside of uh, Vermont, all the companies in Vermont, and there's 17 different municipals and larger companies, they pooled all of their transmission resources and formed Velco. It was the first in nation of transmission only company. And we are owned by the 17 electric companies in the state. Now, one of the things about that is that all of our profit, and we are regulated at the federal level, not the state level. And at the federal level, all of our profit that we make goes back to these um, electric rate customers of the state of Vermont to lower their, their costs um, of electricity. So we generate, uh, so there doesn't go to shareholders um, um, and it doesn't go to, we don't retain any earnings. All of that money goes back to reduce the cost of electricity in Vermont. So it's a little bit unique that way. Um, we have 700 miles of transmission lines, um, over a billion dollars of investment in the state of Vermont. And we also run a very large fiber optic communications, private, private communication system um, throughout Vermont which is, going, is really important um, to run the power system, but also um, probably is going to uh, play some kind of role in bringing broadband capabilities um, to underserved um, areas in the state of Vermont, because we do go places where nobody else goes, um, so that we may have some partnership that we can help in that case. All right, so that's kind of Velco. Um, so one of the things people talk about is that, oh, the power grid's changing so much. Well, the power, power grid's always been changing, right? It's just changing pretty rapidly now, but it's always been changing. Um, we have, we, you know, originally the power system started with microgrids, right? So that's a kind of a, a terminology people use now, microgrids. Well, every, back when Edison and George um, Westinghouse were competing, they were signing up towns. Every town was a microgrid. Every downtown was a microgrid. So the things evolved where they tied lines together between towns. Next thing you know, power plants got bigger and more efficient and cheaper. So we built big power plants. Unfortunately, the power plants were where people lived. So we had to build transmission lines to them. Nuclear plants showed up. And uh, in New England, uh, the, the, the highest voltage that we have is 345,000 volt lines. And that system, which is the interstate power system that ties together all six states in New York and New Brunswick together. Um, that actually was built originally on six nuclear power plants that were built in the 1960s. Um, all of those first generation nuclear plants are all shut down now. So now, you know, so things have always changed and adapted and, and we've had to deal with that uh, going through energy crises and different types of fuel and now this is a different type of fuel. Distributive energy resources are dramatically increasing, which I'll talk about. They, uh, unfortunately, um, distributed power sources, particularly renewables, um, they're intermittent. Um, they're not controllable. You can't control the weather. So there's some issues associated with that. It creates new challenges for somebody like me trying to keep the lights on. Um, a lot of the older, almost, I think there's only one coal plant left in all of New England. That's a good thing. Those coal plants are all going away, and that one will go away eventually. Uh, they're being replaced with smaller uh, renewable energy resources. Uh, but like I said, that's weather dependent, which I'll talk about later. And uh, the uh, the backbone of the system, still majority of it is natural gas. Um, we are dependent on natural gas for over 50% of our generation sources in New England. Um, so even though we have keep adding a lot of renewable energy, 
we are completely dependent on natural gas and no um, we have a long ways to go to be able to be self-sufficient without natural gas. And at the same time, we're looking at new uses of electricity. Um, uh, natural gas is a lot cleaner than oil or coal, uh, but it is still, um, we would like to be able to use more renewable sources. But we have all these new loads, electric vehicles, um, cold temperature um, heat pumps, which are a great invention. Uh, particularly here in Vermont. So we have people want to use electricity as cleaner than using combustion um, um, engines to move your vehicles around. So there's a lot of going to happen in this space over the next 10 years, huge amount. Um, and uh, now the other thing is uh, most of the, the loads are solid state. People don't have regular light bulbs. They all have uh, light bulbs that are electronic. Electronic uh, percentage of electronic equipment is very high. Um, there's some pluses and minuses to that. The system was built over 100 years ago and uh, has had to adapt to all these new changes that are coming about. So I'll talk a little bit about some of those things, but it's always changing. So coming back to Vermont for a minute. <clears throat> um, so there was a nuclear plant in Vermont, Vermont Yankee in Vernon, Vermont. Um, in the southern part of the state, and that shut down in 2014. That was one of the original kind of six uh, that were around at that time, uh, built in the um, late 60s, early 70s. Um, the load, load, the use of electricity in Vermont, um, the peak of that is 1,000 megawatts. And that happens to be, that's where it's been for the last 10 years. It goes back to almost, uh, um, the peak load ever set was like 10,060 which was set in like 2006, seven year time frame. So energy conservation um, and new um, electronic devices on lighting have really paid off and that's kept the uh, peak load in Vermont from increasing. Really it's done a lot of the things it's done, um, really done what it was supposed to do. The, um, the peak load, the peak hour of the year is in the winter at, after dark. It's typically around six o'clock on a really cold winter day. That's usually the peak of the year. And in the summertime though, okay, it's also after dark in Vermont. We are the only state in New England where our peak in the summertime happens when the sun goes down. And the reason for that is the high percentage of um, solar that we have in the state of Vermont. And I'll show you some curves that show that dramatically. Okay, uh, nobody else does that. Uh, the rest of New England peaks in the late in the afternoon now. So we have over 350, we're actually close to 380 megawatts of photovoltaics or PV in, um, in, um, in the state. Unfortunately, none of those are working because our peak hour is after dark on both the summer and winter. So that begs the question, you know, how are you gonna deal with that? You know, the storage batteries are a big, helpful and, and over the future that will be a big important component of the generation mix or at least helping us solve for that issue that that peak so all of those all of those photovoltaics are turned off when we hit our peak load so that's not a good thing so the other generation we have we have about 150 megawatts of wind that in of i think five or six different locations in the state of vermont um, we have 120 megawatts of hydro plants those are uh, historical, they've been around a long time. Those do not include the ones on the Connecticut River, which there is a sizable, probably 10 times that along the, hydro, um, along the Connecticut River. Um, but uh, these are ones that are just on inside the state. Most of these are small hydro plants. Um, in spring runoff, when the snow melts, these uh, we can do 120 megawatts. Um, these are all run of the river. What does that mean? That means that you have to keep the water flowing there aren't big reservoirs uh, behind those to store the water. So pretty much if it rains or the snow melts, you have to, the plants run. You know, and if they, um, if it's uh, middle of August when the water's low, they don't generate much at all. So it's very variable. We bring in 225 megawatts, about a quarter of our peak load comes from Hydro Quebec, that's what HQ is. And we have a terminal in um, Highgate, Vermont, near the Canadian border, uh, right off of Route um, 89, near the border, 
that um, takes power from Canada and we, we import it into the state 24-7 um, pretty much now uh, from Hydro-Quebec. And that's hydropower that comes down over that. In addition, in the state, we have, uh, it's actually probably closer to 2,500 now or 2,200 definitely, uh, Tesla power walls. These are batteries that are in people's houses, barns, and I'll talk a little bit about those. So that's interesting. Um, cool. That's a big. That's a big deployment to have dispersed like that. There's also two utility scale um, battery storage plants in Vermont, but two more being built right now. So um, so batteries and storage are going to play a big um, part of our future in the energy space, and we're doing it. Okay. So that's kind of the Vermont situation. So this chart right here that talks a little bit, all I want to say, it's an, a little bit of an eye test, but I just want to say this is the Vermont resources. We don't have any, um, except for, uh, we don't have really any um, carbon-based or, or carbon-fueled power plants in the state anymore. There is some um, jets that run on diesel, uh, 150 megawatts. They very rarely run their emergency, uh, 150 megawatts, of them, but they don't run very often. But we have methane landfill plants that take gas off of landfills. Um, we have wind, the wind plants, we have solar, a lot of solar. Um, uh, the difference between solar behind the meter and on the power system, the 20 megawatts of solar is actually on the transmission system, which I'll show you a picture of that later. And behind the meter, these are on, you know, these are on distribution systems and small fields and those type of things, all right? The point I wanna make out, there's a lot of renewable there, but a lot of it's weather dependent. Right. So I just wanted to make that point. A lot of this is based on the weather. So um, so I'm going to do that. The next chart I'm going to show you, and this is what they call originally, this is called the California duck curve. Um, California duck curve. Why would they call it? Well, depending if you pick one of these lines, it looks like a duck. Right. Supposedly. Um, but what is this chart? This is 24 hour period. Right. So this is midnight to midnight. And this is the load in the state of Vermont, okay? So it goes up to about, I've got it here, and this is in April. So loads are lower in April, but this is goes up to 700 megawatts. So what happens, people are sleeping, okay? So each one of these is a different year. So as you go down, the lowest one is 2019. I actually do have, um, is 2019. So in the spring, in the spring, the, it makes this more dramatic in the spring, but so you can see this started in 2015, so it goes down. So as we've, uh, in the middle of the night, this is energy efficiency here, in the in lighting loads is lower now because there's uh, lighting energy efficiency. So people get up in the morning, they start using electricity, the sun isn't up necessarily. Um, so we end up with a peak really early in the morning, right? People are making breakfast and everything, and then the sun comes out. And this is a sunny day in April, okay? Sunny day in April. So this is uh, here. And wow. So in the middle of the day, 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock, in the middle of the afternoon in the state of Vermont, the net load, so it could be peak of uh, up to 1,000, is, is down 400. Um, three Sundays ago in April, our low number was 200 megawatts. So unbelievably low. The interesting point is on a sunny day, you can see that basically around 2017, we crossed over that in the middle of the uh, middle of the day, the electric net use is lower than the middle of the night, which is kind of blasphemy um, in the industry. But that is true. We are so much looking like California now, it's amazing. So uh, like I said, now we're off, we're down to the very bottom of this chart uh, as of a couple of weeks ago. So the sun starts going down. So the sun starts going down and all that solar starts turning off. So we have to supplement uh, other energy sources by importing power from other places uh, to supply the load. And your typical peak is around eight to nine o'clock at night. Um, and in the, in the spring, and then in the, in the um, it's actually um, a little bit later in the um, middle of the summer, we hit the peak. So, 
So then in the middle of the night, it goes back, starts going back down. So a duck curve, California duck curve, California's issue was, um, and we don't have as big an issue here in Vermont, but this is the issue. If the ramp rate of this line as the sun is setting is too steep, traditional power plants can't make up the difference. The ink use of electricity is increasing faster than mechanically gas turbines, for example, can can generate the increases that much. So in California, they had a very aggressive storage um, program, basically that they, they, they have charged batteries and they discharge the batteries um, during the sun going down period of time to keep that, that increase uh, slope um, um, to a point where the mechanical uh, generators can not get in trouble. So that's what that uh, slope is. That is why uh, a good part of the uh, manage, uh, that's why storage is a big player when you get into a high degree of um, photovoltaics. And the peak is after dark now. Now, what is this top line here? This is 2019, a couple days from this chart down here. And what is the difference? The big difference is it was a cloudy day. So one day, cloudy, rainy, looks like this, really, which is the way it used to look 10 years ago. And then the sun comes out, and it looks like this. And you're trying to plan a power system that the energy use is radically different depending on the weather. That's what I mean. You're, you're really weather dependent. And being able to forecast that matters. OK? And you'll see in here that there's squiggly lines because there may be um, clouds in certain areas. There is load, you know, people use electricity. It's not as constant as that. Okay. So now I'm going to um, show you a picture of a 20 megawatt um, solar plant located uh, in the background. You see those ski slopes, that's a chemo. That's Mount Akimo ski area. This is in Ludlow and Cavendish. Um, this has 89,000 individual solar panels. It takes up, it takes about 20, uh, five acres for one megawatt. So this is a hundred acres of uh, land. It was a big old farm. They did cut down 20 acres of trees. Uh, much to my horror, um, to to get this in, but it's a 20 wet megawatt power plant um, that's tied off the transmission system. Unfortunately, this power plant that generates 20 megawatts when it's sunny out sells its power to Connecticut and not from one. So just one of the sticking points, the fact that um, in many cases, um, a lot of developers have built solar plants, large ones in particular, that are, they're going through the licensing process in Vermont, but they do not have contracts with the Vermont utilities. They are selling it at a higher price to out-of-state out of state, um, um, out of state companies. So it's interesting, unfortunate, but just a dirty little secret there. But, um, but work really well. So, tale of two Sundays. So, the, I just wanted to let you know that um, this would have been, uh, this is a traditional load uh, back in 2012 before anybody had solar panels on their roofs. And now this is what it kind of would look like. And this is, just happens to be 18. But this duck curve now, this is what it used to be. And this is what the load looks like. So, just in the short six years, radically different um, power system um, usage. Okay, big deal. Um, same thing, uh, similar, here's an overcast day, okay, and this is the sunny day, okay. So these days were just a couple of days apart. Now, this was in the winter time. So you say winter, let's talk about the winter time, right? So what happens in the winter? The sun comes up later, it sets earlier, right? So the sun is set by five o'clock. So you're peaking at six o'clock at night when everybody is, uh, 
using their stoves and heating systems and TVs and all the lights are on. So this winter load is this peak is a big deal. Um, it's a big deal. Now during the overcast period, um, you know, during the day um, on an overcast day, your load looks like this. It's about a 300 megawatt difference on a peak of a thousand. So this this day in February, the peak was 900 after dark. So the a third change, and this is just this is just one day. So this is one day away from each other, and you're trying to run a system like that. And it's very it's not necessarily trivial. Um, the point is, you can get solar in the winter time as long as there's not cloud um, snow on the panels. Okay. Um, wind. Let's well, let's talk about solar and let's talk about clouds. So that big 20 megawatt solar generation plan I showed you, that's in um, Budlow. Um, so this is how the generation output from that plan is on a partly cloudy, partly sunny day. So it's 20 megawatts, that's the maximum. So you see periods of time when the sun was brightly shining, cloud comes by, boom, it drops down to 12, right? And then the sun comes out from around the cloud, it goes up. So your generation is very, on a cloudy day, it's crazy. Um, and you're trying to balance generation versus the use of electricity on um, an instantaneous basis. It's just another thing you have to deal with because you can't control clouds. And it's hard to even predict clouds. You can predict that it's gonna be partly cloudy, but nobody tells you the clouds are gonna be there at one, one, you know, at 10 minutes past one, and it's going to be, the cloud's gonna take five minutes to go by. To, nobody can figure that out yet. So as a result, we have to just live with the fact that these things vary quite a bit and they're not constant. So that's a cool chart. Um, not a lot of people have those type of charts available for you. So I thought I'd show you some neat, neat variability. Um, one of the things is uh, because of renewables and, and other things is that um, use of uh, air conditioning and stuff that the winter in Vermont and the summer peaks are about the same. They, they, were, they actually, you know, we're about the same in the winter and the summer. At one time, we were really winter peaking um, for a long time. And then we crossed over and now we're pretty much the same. And let's see. But, but um, you used to be able to set your watch when the summer peak was going to be. You could tell the summer peak was the third day of a heat wave, like today, at between 1 and 2 o'clock. Guaranteed. Right, that was going to be one of your peak days in the summer, a third day of a heat wave, but not anymore. So your hour now in Vermont is after it used to be in the middle of the day. You can see that these are years going back to 2002 when the peaks were at different months in the summer. Um, but now you can see the circle is where since 2014, 15, 16, they're all after a dark. We're all doing it when the sun's starting to go down, um, pretty reliably. So. So that's our when our peaks are. So um, I'm not going. I'm going to skip that one. So one of the things is is that um, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of our challenges. Um, we can't see all of the solar plants. Um, we don't have real time information on them. We can only look at certain information. Um, what is going to happen in the power system going forward is. Um, gathering up information from remote um, um, generators is going to be important and incre increasingly important. Some of that will have to come back over the internet, but it won't be for operational purposes, but we'll need that. Um, we're monitoring a lot more on the technical side about new sensors. The price of sensors has dropped that allows you to monitor a lot more. Um, we can do a lot more predictive maintenance and performance to keep our reliability up. Vermont has one of the highest transmission reliabilities in the United States of America. That's pretty amazing considering all the trees we have uh, in Vermont and how rugged some of our terrain is. Um, there is a, I apologize. There is a lot of um, new technologies that we're uh, bringing into the business to monitor what's going on, to reduce our operating costs. 
So that's what I wanted to just uh, to mention here. And we have huge databases now that we have the capability of analyzing data um, at a, a level that nobody ever imagined we could um, in the past, which has really helped us a lot. Having a telecommunication high speed system is, is uh, really helpful. So I just thought you'd be interested in some of the renewable integration issues. So one is weather dependencies, all right? So that doesn't get us all the solar output that we would like when there's snow on them. Um, I joke that we, you know, full employment would be to get a whole bunch of high school kids after it snows or brooms to brush them off, brush all the snow off so we could get the free energy. But um, that's an issue um, that we are dependent upon snow uh, or weather. Um, that also has to do with uh, wind, right? The wind does not blow much in the summertime in Vermont, I'll be honest. We, uh, that is the low period is in the summertime. The spring and the fall is the windiest times here and in the winter. The problem in the winter, though, is that any ice on a blade, uh, a windmill blade, um, puts it out of commission. So, um, so a lot of times in the winter, it doesn't generate as much as we would like it to because uh, depending on the um, whether there's any ice build up on those blades. So, so you are weather dependent. You can't count on all of it. That's a problem. Okay. And of course, solar doesn't work in the night. So, um, or when it snows. And um, the other thing that I, I talk about is that all of these newer technologies use electronic inverters to convert from DC power to AC power. So that's okay. The problem is any of the the smaller ones that are on rooftops, um, most of them are connected to the internet with no cyber regulations on them. So the bigger plants all have really stringent cyber regulations. The transmission system has incredibly stringent cyber regulations that we spend a lot of time on. But if you have three panels on your house or six panels in your house and you have an inverter in your basement or in, the, in your garage, there's a good chance that the inverter company can can up monitors that inverter in the output so you can see it on your phone and see what you're generating and all that great stuff. Uh, the, the, all the bad thing is there is no software on that thing for um, hacking into. And if uh, in the majority of the inverters that were bought in the past have been come from China and there is nobody has checked, the government is working on checking the malware that could be embedded in those, um, in those inverters and as a result, that that scares people like me a lot. So that if somebody were to shut those all off at the wrong time, that could be a really bad thing. So just to let you know that uh, there are a lot of people worrying about that right now. Um, one of the issues with renewables is voltages. So during the day when all the sun is uh, shining and all those distributed solar cells are cranking out power, the voltage goes up on those distribution circuits. And we have to um, basically try to bring the voltage down to within acceptable limits. Um, so that is an issue. Um, and then um, and we have to do a lot on the transmission system because um, there isn't a lot of power moving around when, when, when you don't have much load. So we have to take actions to do that. So that that's just something, it's a different way to run things. The other thing, as you get into larger renewable projects, they're not near where people live. So the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont is a great place to put renewables, but the transmission system there is not sized properly to be able to export that much power. And right now there's about 75 meg or 50 megawatts worth of uh, load in the rural part of Vermont on that Northeast Kingdom area, but there's 400 megawatts worth of uh, generation up there. And uh, the problem is, is that's the most it can take, even though there's plenty of land to build more renewables up there, somebody's got to figure out who pays for the transmission rates. Is it the customers of Vermont, if, particularly if it's going to be somebody building a plant that's going to sell it to Connecticut or Massachusetts? Is it going to be the developers who are going to pay for it, but they have a big lobby um, in Montpelier and you know, don't want to pay for the upgrade. So somebody's going to have to figure that out over the next couple of years. Uh, otherwise, we will be constrained and not be able to meet our uh, renewable objectives. So different states have uh, tackled this differently. Texas built the transmission system to allow wind to happen in West Texas. 
um, and they socialize those costs amongst all customers. Um, other you know places haven't. Uh, in California, on a daily basis, they shut off 2,000 megawatts worth of renewables on a daily basis in, in, in California because there's no way to, um, they can't take that much onto the system and move it around. So eventually this is gonna have to become a, an issue that um, a political issue is somebody's gonna solve it so that we can have as much renewable energy as we really want to have on our, on our power system. Somebody's gonna have to pay for the upgrades. So, um, so particularly where as you've used up most of the land near the near uh, near where people live. So looking forward, um, I wanted to just mention the fact that the New England states are reducing your greenhouse gases quite a bit by a lot of this uh, renewables. That's good and going to natural gas. Um, all the old, crappy, dirty power plants are retiring. That's good. Um, there are new uses for electricity. Um, happening all the time. We, we will see more and more electric vehicles um, in storage devices like batteries, water, um, and other concepts will be commonplace in the future. I'm convinced of it. Um, that is in Rutland, Vermont, a picture of a solar array, a um, couple megawatts, and but it also has got um, batteries associated with it. So um, it has two different types of batteries there. Um, as well as solar. This is um, our Velco's newest, um, it's called the static bar compensator device. It's a solid state um, electronic device which controls voltage at a very fast speed. It's located in Scutney, Vermont. It was put in service a year ago. And part of the thing is, is we really need to be able to control voltage um, at a really sophisticated level and we've needed to use newer technologies to be able to do that. Um, um, so because of the changing nature of the, of the power system. There's a picture of a Tesla power wall right here, one of the over 2000 that Green Mountain Power has installed. Green Mountain Power rents these for about uh, $15 a month. So you can put one in your house for $15 a month. Um, it's rented from Green Mountain Power. Green Mountain Power has the option to drain it a few times a year, a month, um, and they use that to control their peak load in the state, um, which uh, pays for it, uh, helps pay for this system. Uh, the customers do uh, fill it back up if it's used, but that's built into the $15 a month rate uh, that you use. Um, the reason you'd want one in your house is that this will basically run your house for or a good part of your house for a day and a half or so or several hours, uh, as long as you don't turn everything on in your house. Um, so it's almost like a cheaper than a generator, right? So um, it's a little backup um, power supply. Uh, it'll allow you to keep some lights on. It'll allow your heat system to run for a couple of days. If you have solar in your roof and design it so that you can charge with solar, We've had, we've seen in big storm, somebody going four days um, on a battery. So that's what that is and that's why it's done. But it's really cool, it's really cool. So I'm just finishing up now saying that today and in the future utilities have lots of great problems to solve. You know, as an engineer, I love solving problems. And this is like so interesting um, of how do, how do we uh, enable, um, enable a future that we have a carbon free generation of electricity um, plan and how do we keep the lights on because it is add a lot of challenges for us doing that. It is more difficult to run a power system with um, renewables than not. And uh, so um, I'm energized and the people who work for us at Velco are really energized to help solving these problems. Um, we're on the cutting edge here in Vermont when it comes to some of these things. So um, thank you for inviting me. Um, thank you, Jenny, um, for allowing me to talk a little bit about some of the things that are going on here in the state, as well as across the country. And um, I will kick it over to you to answer any questions that you would like to, or uh, any of you on online would like to ask of me. 
Thanks so much, Chris. That was great. Um, I'll just remind all of our listeners that um, for those of you watching on our website live stream, if you click on the video, you will see the chat box on the right side where you can add your question. And if you're watching on our Facebook live stream, you can add your question to the comment box below. Um, so kicking it off with our first question, according to the New York Times, nearly a decade ago, coal supplied nearly half of our electricity. We've seen decreases in coal that would seem unthinkable a decade ago. Do you think that we could have a similar decrease in liquefied natural gas as we switch to renewables in the next decade or so? Um, you're absolutely right. The coal um, generation used to be 50% and now it is really, it's it's less than 20 in the country, but in, in, in a lot of regions, it's almost zero. Um, the uh, natural gas, so I think instead of liquefied natural gas, natural gas, the natural gas situation um, is going to take longer to solve, but is definitely my sense over time is natural gas will go down. I don't think it's going to be eliminated um, unless the storage battery technology becomes, has, it's got to take a quantum lead in pricing. Um, the price of natural gas is really inexpensive. And um, in, in combined cycle power plants are very efficient now. And so as a result of that, I do think it's gonna be a while. Um, I do think it will drop. Um, right now, every time you add more solar onto your system, the natural gas plants back off. But in the night, we're running on gas at night, I'll be honest, right? So we're running on gas and nuclear at night. So you gotta end up figuring out how to deal with that situation. I do think that in the winter time, there's a competition between natural gas for heating and natural gas for generation of electricity. Um, this is uh, hopefully the large gen um, renewable um, wind farms that are scheduled to go off the coast of Martha's Vineyard and in Nantucket. Um, those are gonna be huge wind farms and they'll be bigger than anything anybody's ever seen around. And those are like 9,000 megawatts. And in the winter time, if they can be, uh, there'll be a big piece of us reducing natural gas generation in the winter time when it snows. So we're really hopeful and, and look forward to the day that we have these big wind farms offshore. They can generate a lot of power. Okay, great. Um, our next question um, is, does Velco or any other entity that you know of have a department or position that focuses specifically on equitable planning and the deployment of new infrastructure. Can you, Jenny, can you just repeat that again? Sure. The question is, does Velco or any other entity that you know of have a department or position that focuses on equitable planning in the deployment of new infrastructure? I'm not sure I know what equitable planning is in part of infrastructure. Um, I What we typically do is um, some of our infrastructure is paid for regionally for reliability. And most of the investments we've made in the past have been to keep the system reliable. In the future, I see the goal, number one goal still is reliability, but the idea is the changing generation mix so when it comes from equitable in terms of who pays for what is one of the big challenges. And we've been working with the department and the state government to try to come up with a solution that works for everyone. So as far as equitable we're concerned, everyone has a voice in this one and trying to figure out how do we actually solve the infrastructure, new requirements for the new world is still a work in progress. It really is a work in progress, I guess that is. Hopefully I answered the question. I wasn't sure, I, I wasn't familiar with that terminology. Great, thank you. Next question is, can you speak to how Vermont is different or not from the rest of New England um, when it comes to renewables in terms of load, solar, et cetera? Yeah. So um, we are far the highest percentage of solar of any of the states. Um, from a wind perspective, um, we are not a leader in the wind that's in Maine. 
but Maine has a problem in Northern Maine, they put a lot of wind farms and we like to put more, but they can't get the power out of there. Similar to the problem that we have in the Northeast Kingdom of uh, Vermont. I mean, you could put more there, but you can't get it out. Same thing with Maine. It's very expensive to get it from Northern Maine to down towards Massachusetts where or, or Southern Maine, where most of the people live. Um, in terms of um, the rest of New England, they are putting a lot of solar in Massachusetts, but most of that solar takes land. So it's being done in central and Western Mass um, and in Connecticut and in rural areas. The problem is, is that um, it's far away from where people live. So you have to build infrastructure to get it there. So that's gonna be one of the issues. You can't put a lot of solar inside 128 in Boston. It's not, this is not enough land to do it. Um, but um, we are number one in solar percentage wise. Um, and uh, our overall renewable numbers, when you add wind and solar capacity, we're at we're at 50 percent of wind and solar. Nobody's nobody's anywhere close to us on the East Coast. Nobody. I mean, you have to go out to Hawaii and California to start getting those numbers. Our next question has to do with the NERA petition at FERC relating to um, distributed distributed generation. And the question is, if FERC grants the petition, what would it mean for Vermont? Um, I don't know the answer to that question, to be honest, exactly what it means. Um, there's a lot of things that are going on um, at FERC. Um, there's a lot of filings that were just made recently on um, particularly, not, not only renewable generation, but a lot on storage. So storage has not been appropriately addressed in terms of um, FERC. Is it a generator? Is it a load? Is What is it? Does it have to play in the market? So um, there's a lot of, I would say in the next year, a lot of the rulings from FERC coming down are going to change things. I don't think it's, I don't think any ruling from FERC, uh, but there will be some rulings from FERC that will have impacts. For example, there will be cyber rules, there'll be a few other things that are gonna come out um, um, that um, will have to be uh, dealt with. But I don't think it's gonna slow down the development of renewables. I really don't believe that. Um, that I, I, I just don't think so. They're gonna, they're gonna do some things to make sure the system's reliable though, I'll be honest, they have to. Okay, we have time for a couple more questions. Um, the next one is, can you speak a little bit about the interface between um, Belco and um, renewable energy um, as it relates to transportation and um, what particular challenges or opportunities are there for Vermont when it comes to um, electrifying transportation? Yeah, it's great. Um, I see a big, huge growth in this area. We, our long-term forecasts show a huge amount of electricity growth there. A couple of things associated with that. One is, I think that uh, you need um, to be able to control the chargers um, when you charge a, a car. So think of it this way. If you have a Tesla and you were to put that Tesla and plug it in on a, let's say a level, uh, a level three charger, which is a fast charger, so you charge fast, that, that uses more electricity than the rest of your house. So you just bought the largest appliance in your house, right? Or it's the same as the rest of your house. Now, if you use a level two charger, it's a little bit lower. It takes longer to charge it up. But these large chargers uh, use a tremendous amount of electricity um, to be able to, you know, if you want to fill up, um, one of the goals is to be able to, within 10 minutes, to charge your car um, at a filling station, an electric charging station, that's going to use a lot of electricity. It's either going to have to be stored on site to do it, or you're going to, you're going to use a huge amount of electricity, uh, that could stress the system. So, um, there's a lot of technical challenges, but I see a day that they're charging stations everywhere. Um, I think they're going to have to be managed. So if there are five cars filling up at once, you know, two of them may be going for five minutes and they'll stop. We'll let the other two go or the other three. So there's going to be some changes going on there. Um, in Europe, what they do in Europe is they have these large filling stations that use a huge amount of power. So in the order of, just to give an idea, like a megawatt's worth of power to charge up a few cars really fast. But what they do is they build it next to a solar field and they have a big battery, power from the street. And then they have a computer program that optimizes, is it better to get it from the street 
Is it to bake it out of the battery or to take it out of the solar plant, right? And at night, you can't take it out of the solar plant. So you, you optimize where you get your power from based on pricing and demand being used right now. Oh, no cars there? Then I'll take all my solar plant and charge my battery. So, so you're going to see kind of new ways of doing business that people haven't thought about. Um, but, I, but we do have to deal with the fact that if it is not managed uh, correctly, it's going to be a problem. So I have a joke that I'll say. How do you know when two people have Teslas and uh, two neighbors have Teslas? The transformer that feeds those two houses on fire because it's not used to taking that kind of load. So uh, literally, if you're in a neighborhood and three people in that neighborhood all end up buying cars and charge them all simultaneously at the same time, there's a good chance that the power system can't supply it in that neighborhood, right? So, so those are the types of th challenges that people are going to have to deal with um, in the future. And I do think that the distribution utilities are getting much more sophisticated about doing that. And as I mentioned before, when you look at that duck curve, when do you want to charge your car? Do you want to charge it at night or would you rather charge it at 2 in the afternoon? I would say charge it at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's the cheapest electricity. It's the lowest use of electricity. But... If you would ask me 10 years ago, my answer was, oh, we'll plug it in at night. We'll charge it all night, right? It's overnight. What do you care? Well, if you plug it in and you let it go at 8 o'clock at night, that's the peak hour. So guess what is generating charging your car at the peak hour? Natural gas, right? So you don't want to charge your car with natural gas. You want to charge it with solar. So you really want to charge it in the middle of the afternoon and use that solar in that carbon-free generation to put in your car. All right, so those are things that we're gonna all have to work out and figure out. And maybe there's more battery storage. You take this over from the day and you charge your car at night. And that's happened in California a lot now. So that 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 that's kind of some of the different thinking. But I'll be honest, I've been in the industry a long time. The things that I thought were like never change, completely like 180 degrees, you know, from that, you know, it's just different. It's cool. Yeah. Thank that really that speaks question. to the importance of workplace charging, right? Because um, that's where a lot of people yeah. are at yeah. two o'clock in the afternoon. Um, yeah, we'll have one last question. Um, so, so Vermont has state goals related to um, renewable energy and um, climate change. And in fact, there's um, a much more ambitious bill before the Vermont legislature right now that would um, even increase that more along the lines of what Massachusetts and New York and California have done. So Chris, when you discuss large scale renewables in Vermont, um, you're talking about solar and wind located in Vermont, but that are not contributing toward Vermont's state goals. So the question was, doesn't all of the large wind and, and solar, don't the renewable energy credits from, from that supply get sold to Massachusetts and Connecticut? Yes. It, it, they do right now, and it does help uh, some cases. Now, the developers develop them in Vermont. The credits don't go to us, don't go back to Vermont. Those are more the ones that developed in the state. Um, then we sell some of those credits get sold to other states. So it depends who actually is developing it. I think, I believe that's the way it works on the credits. Um, the um, In terms of us developing... Um, not all the big ones are being developed in the state. Um, and um, to meet our goals, though, if we were to increase significantly, we're going to have to build some transmission. And the legislative um, goal, which was to take the tier two level of uh, renewables and increase double it. So our estimates is that could cost as much as several hundred million dollars worth of infrastructure would have to be um, added to the system, modified to the power system to be able to connect that level of um, generation. So, so it's just, it, it, my, in my mind, it always comes back to who pays, right? So we, we want to do this. The state wants to do it. I want to do it. But we just got to figure out the pricing mechanism. How do we do it? So I wish I had a better answer. And I wish... Nobody does. The governor doesn't. Nobody has an answer about who pays yet. So I think that's one of our biggest challenges um, of meeting the 90%. Um, I think that we can go long ways to meeting the goal. I don't think it's totally unachievable. I do worry about tractor trailer trucks 
how are we going to get to electric tractor trailer trucks? I'm not sure how that works too well. Um, they're all going to be, you're going to have to rebuild all the bridges because the tractor trailer trucks, uh, if you try to use, um, um, if you try to use um, batteries, you're going to be pulling a second trailer with batteries on it. So that weight was going to be an issue with bridges in Vermont. But, um, but so that one's the one I was very much, I think a lot of the other ones are solvable. Um, they're coming out with electric pickup trucks next year. I always said you cannot, you cannot have electric vehicles in Vermont. You have a, a four wheel drive electric pickup truck. There's two companies coming out, GM's coming out and um, another company, a new startup company is coming out with a really cool looking pickup truck. So now that we're going to have pickup trucks in Vermont, people will be really happy to embrace <laughs> that. <technology. laughs> Hey, you know, as long as you can put snow tires on it here, I think we can make it work. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, all right. Yeah. So. Okay, well, we're we're just about out of time. We want to give um, our students and professors, especially a couple of minutes to transition to their one o'clock class. Um, but thank you so much, Chris. That was excellent, really enlightening. And for those of you that listened, thank you. And um, you can catch our next Hot Topics lecture, which will be on June 4th. And that will be with Pat Parento, uh, who's a professor at Vermont Law School. And his the title of his talk that he'll be presenting is Clean Water Update, the Maui Decision, Waters of the U.S. Wars Part Two, and World's Worst Copper Mine, and more. So we hope to see you then. Thanks for joining.